Hello and welcome to the last Arvos of Harvo for December. This is going to probably feel a bit rushed as I try to get everything out this year, but we get to put a nice bow on 2022 and it's been 85 books this year, which is, I think like, what, 85 times more than what I was doing a few years ago, right? It's crazy. It's like, I think the fact that I am making these videos now has been a huge help in actually motivating me to finish these books, and also the challenge has been very useful. I've read so much more widely than I normally would, and I have been so looking forward to being able to put down my thoughts on each book onto a video. So I'm going to finish up this year, and hopefully we will continue with more momentum next year. Alright, so the last set of books are... Okay, so I had to... I have to get up and move my way, so I probably am sitting in the wrong place, not a very good cut, but anyways, this is the last seven books of the year, and I got through one of each category, I did have to bend the rules a little bit, but we got the book number one for December. I did in fact finish Foucault's Pendulum. This was not as hard as I thought it would be. It was pretty hard, and I did take about 14 days to get through it. I did end up writing down my notes for what happened in each chapter. But halfway through, I realized I didn't even need it because this book's chapters are so short. It's like maybe one chapter every two or three pages. And so it was quite easy for me to get through. Even all of the symbols, they were very tactile. It reminded me surprisingly of Del Toro quests, you know, those old school young adult novels that had the little puzzles in them. This book also had that dynamic where they would represent the little ciphers or codes that the characters were trying to use to, tr to hold their conspiracy. And this book is ultimately about conspiracy theories. It's about how if you try hard enough, you can make everything connect to everything else, and you can construct a grand narrative conspiracy theory to suggest that everybody is in on it, and what it is can vary. So conspiracy theories can be very powerful in manipulating those who want to believe in something to force them to view one particular defined it as true. And so what ends up happening in this book is we have three book publishers with strange names, Casabon, uh, Don, Donatovelli, and uh, Belbo. And those three work for a book publishing firm called... I don't know why I want to call it Garamond. I think it actually is Garamond. And they also have a subset called Minutius, which is a vanity publishing firm. So the protagonist is a studier of the Knights Templar myth, and he gets this job as a worker and an editor and a researcher with Garamond, and they realize that there are a lot of people who are really into conspiracy theories, and so they decide to feed all that data into a computer, a 1990s, 1980s version of ChatGPT, and they spit out this ridiculous conspiracy theory that involves everything in the world, and people buy into it, right? And over the course of something like, well, it's too many words, way too many words, every major cultural artifact of the 20th, 19th, 18th, 17th, every century of human history gets bound up into this huge conspiracy theory. And that's why the book is so long, right? It's because it needs to connect everything from Walt Disney to the Order of the Rose Cross to the Knights Templar to every single conspiracy theory imaginable into this big convoluted ball of chaos and panic. And is it a good read? No. <laughs> I would not I would not force this on somebody. I think the entire time reading this I was thinking to myself, wow, this is so ridiculously well researched. So much work has gone into all of the details of this book, but then again, why? What is the purpose of doing this? What is gained by doing this except to flex the author's intelligence? And the author's very intelligent, it's worked very hard. And I think to a certain subset of people who know a lot of trivia about world history and religion and myths and culture and secret societies, this could be very interesting because it validates a lot of the theories that have abounded. But for a normie like myself, did I enjoy reading this? Not really. There are a few weird tidbits that I did get, like, for example, John Dee is a real historical figure, and he was Queen Elizabeth's court astrologer, which is a role that I did not know existed. He was just there in the court, reading the stars and magicianing his way through society, and it's theorized that he was the 
the basis for Prospero and the Tempest, a person who is so deep into the runes that they get the whole position usurped from them. Anyways, that's Foucault's Pendulum. <sighs> Intelligence-wise, this is a 5 out of 5. Just the amount of raw information that's contained in here, there's so much stuff in there. But from a reading perspective, like a reading experience perspective, of enjoyment and meaning and worth of your time, it's a 3 out of 5. I can't in good conscience recommend this unless you already know you're definitely in for it. Uh, that's Foucault's Pendulum. Oh, I feel exhausted having read this, but it wasn't that hard. Book 2 is Housekeeping. Taking off from something difficult, getting into something that I knew I would enjoy. This is a book by Marilyn Robinson, who is quite known for being part of the Iowa's writer's circle. And she has a very technique heavy writing style, which is divisive, but I genuinely love. I really loved Gilead. I thought that book was incredible. I can flick to any page of that book and read a few sentences and go, wow, this is just, this is the good, right? This is so, so good. Every bit of it is amazing. And housekeeping is a little bit different in that I find that housekeeping works as one nice self-contained novel. It's about a, a family in a small town in Idaho called Fingerbone. And this is a town cursed with a horrific train accident that occurred several decades prior to the book's events, where the patriarch of this family uh, was a train conductor and he passed away and the train just fell right off the bridge into the lake. And this lake becomes such a salient symbol across the entire text. It's almost as if the water starts invading the, ha the lives of the people there. People start relating to their life experiences, connecting to water, the feeling of being underwater, the feeling of dreaming like you're in water, the way that the lake floods every year and it enters people's homes and it beats the water and this, the, all the trauma within that water invades people's lives. And it's just so rich and detailed and emotional and wonderful. We follow a protagonist named Ruth, who is a bit not very outspoken. And she's living in the shadow of the, I guess the traumatic family situation that resulted from eventually her grandfather, who was the one who passed away in the train accident. Uh, her mother, is absent and so she's raised by an aunt and that aunt is trying her best but is also very clearly not a family oriented person and so we see this character who is trying her best to be maternal but is just so naturally a distant and reclusive and independent person try to raise after two children who really need the support but also don't truly understand what it means to be part of a full family unit because no one they've connected to has been like that, right? And so the emotions here are super complex. They are tied together really nicely with these symbols of the, the lake and of nature and of the house that they've inherited. And just the entire time I was reading it, I was just spellbound in this very powerful sense of longing and wistfulness. And so it's quite different from Gilead because that was a book that I can read in short bursts and really pick apart this individual's life. Whereas Housekeeping to me is maintaining this emotional experience and keeping the reader submerged in this metaphor of water, making sure that they feel how overwhelming and weighty the experience of being part of this family can be. I really, really enjoyed it. I thought the emotions ran home so, so clearly. I love the overall metaphor of housekeeping, this idea that you are making a space and taking care of it for somebody else, and how life itself is just a form of housekeeping. It's just keeping things tidy, making sure things need to, things are where they need to be. And that's really it, right? These little small patterns that we need to do that take effort and our labor, but ultimately, indicate how we feel about ourselves and the people around us and how we take care of the people and places in our lives. It's just complex and emotional and beautiful. Easy 5 out of 5. One of the best reads this year. Just absolutely incredible. I've heard people say that Marilyn Robinson's style is not for them and I see why that might be the case because it's very slow paced and if you would have to ask me what happens in this novel I really couldn't tell you. There's not really a lot of big events and when big events happen, I feel like the novel actually weakens a bit because 
it starts being about what's happening instead of how we feel about existing in this space. But, ugh, oh, five out of five, so good. Oh my god, god. it's so good. You know when you have, like, books and you read it and you just don't understand how they can be this good? How does a human being get this talented and this in tune with emotions and human beings? Like, how do, how do you make something this good? How do you do that? Ah, how is it this good? Okay, we're gonna go from very good to very bad. This is Brideshead's Revisited by Evelyn War. Ah. If you look at a cover like this, and a back like that, and you think, am I gonna enjoy this novel? I already kind of knew that I wouldn't like it, and maybe this is me discriminating against its author, Evelyn War, who is one of the few very well-known conservative literary authors, right? His work, well, his personality reinforces the belief in aristocracy. When he was writing in the 1940s and 1950s, when England was moving towards more of a sense of egalitarianism and the whole world was starting to pay more attention to the lives and the affairs of everyday people. In fact, this would even been happening in the 1800s, but in the 1950s, he writes about the aristocratic people in society and he writes in a way that, I guess, kind of celebrates the historic rights of the aristocrats to be more powerful and have more freedom and liberty than everybody else. The characters in this text are wildly affluent, can go all around Europe, do whatever they want with their lives, and it is framed as a bit of a tragedy that they are so hedonistic and they are squandering their fortunes and their, I guess, their position, but there is still a sense that there are two classes in the world, right? There are the aristocrats who have the ability to do whatever they want and to shape the world in their image. And there are the servants and people from non-Western countries who just don't get that. And this novel really doesn't question that divide. It doesn't suggest that anyone is better or worse. It just represents the idea of the ruling class being powerful as something that exists. And I see this often compared to The Great Gatsby, this is a very British work, The Great Gatsby is a very American work. The Great Gatsby is also quite critical of its aristocratic class, but it shows that downfall in a beautiful and poetic way. And this one... Well, I should talk about what it's about, right? It's about a house called Brideshead and a family who... its youngest generation, people in their 20s, uh, are set to eventually inherit this house, but they're not quite... They're, they're delinquents, they're hooligans. They go to university and they squander their time and they get into crazy relationships and live on their emotions. Whereas the previous generation are much more stoic. They hold on to their possessions and their belongings and they want things to kind of remain the way that they are. And so we follow our protagonist, uh, I have forgotten his name. I want to say it's Charles Araby, but that's the name of the protagonist in The Sea of the Sea. It's Charles Ryder, I think? I know his surname is Ryder. Okay, we follow Charles Ryder, and he is a student at a prestigious university where he meets... I've forgotten all of the names of the characters in the novel. That's how much I didn't get them. Okay, he meets Sebastian, and Sebastian is this heir of Brideshead, but He's this eccentric fellow, he's very energetic, he has this teddy bear that he carries around everywhere, and he just likes to play jokes and, you know, make friends and caros. And we follow the adventures of these characters, going through school, getting arrested for just <laughs> public drunkenness, and then eventually we see their lives branch out, and we see what each of them does with their lives. And our protagonist is kind of intertwined in that, but also intertwined in the military conflicts that occurred in the 1940s in Europe. And what really happens in this novel? I guess the protagonist is just kind of there as a witness to the downfall of this family. And I have, I'm having such a hard time remembering exactly what happens. I think I had an issue too because I was reading this on the train and I couldn't quite concentrate on just what was going on. But 
ultimately there were issues about who's marrying who and who's going to inherit what how we take care of this old home and how do we treat the older generation I can't even remember what's the most salient thing about it I just remember generally disliking all these characters and I was going to give it a 1 out of 5 but it seems a bit I don't know sensationalist to give it a 1.5 a 1 out of 5 maybe it gets a 2 out of 5 because there are still those rare moments of beauty where we see the humanity in these characters and Evelyn Waugh is a very skilled writer I'm not trying to criticize him for having political views that are very different to mine I can clearly see that he knows how to craft a character he knows how to craft a good sentence even but they don't have that resonance to me because they're just describing a world that is so far away from my own personal experiences and interests this is a world where I just don't connect to, and I've never been close to that, and I don't think I ever will. I think maybe if you have that kind of English family history, it does mean something to you. But I see this book on so many classics lists, and I just don't get it. And I think that this is one of those books that is going to fade away faster than some other ones, right? Maybe in 50 years' time, we won't see people talking about it that much. I do know that Evelyn Waugh is very prolific in English literature around the 1900s. There's quite a few other novels that he's written, quite a few on my shelf, and I don't know if I will get to them because many people say that this is his best work. He himself has said this is one of his most sentimental and unrealistic, so I, I don't know. It's a 2 out of 5. Judging by how little I remember it, literally two weeks after reading it, it's probably not going to rank very highly in my list of classics. Okay, we continue with the books I have not enjoyed. I'm so sorry. This is Cloud Street by Tim Winton. Often called one of the great Australian classics, it is Australian. That's one of the most positive things I can say about it. It is, in many, many ways, very Australian. And I think it's a quite clear representation of what we might talk about when we talk about the Australian myth, which is the idea of the Australian battler, the person who has done it rough and has faced quite a few setbacks in their life, and is of the working class, but through determination and through good spirits, they are able to, if not overcome, then at least survive, right? It's a very everyday look at what I'm sure this author would consider to be everyday Australians people who have blue-collar jobs, if jobs at all, people who are struggling to make it through month by month, but people who have big hearts and who have big families and love the people around them, even though their expression of love can sometimes cause harm as much as it causes positive effects. So we follow two large families. We follow the lambs and we follow the pickles. And each one is beset by its own personal tragedy. On the pickles side, the father early in the novel has a accident at work and he loses many of the fingers on his right hand and so that makes him quite unable to work and he becomes addicted to gambling and that brings his metaphor of the shadow of the world where he believes his family is perennially cursed with bad luck and one of the very fortunate things that happens to him is that he for whatever reason inherits this enormous house in Perth on Cloud Street, which eventually be called, becomes called Cloud Street, and he decides to cut it in half and rent out the other half to the opposite family, which is the Lambs. And the Lamb family is huge. It's the fa mother and father and six kids, but we follow two kids in particular, which is Quick and Fish. And early on in the novel, before they move into Cloud Street, there's a fishing accident where Fish gets caught up in a net and dragged underwater, and he's resuscitated, but it results in him having an intellectual disability. And so the family is trying to cope with that, and Quick has survivor's guilt. He, ha he is the younger brother, but he sees Fish before as this very intelligent and charismatic enigmatic figure, and now that Fish has lost all of that, Quick doesn't really know how to, how to live, right? He is in this constant state of mourning, because he feels like something's gone wrong in the universe. And so we put these two families in this one big house and we see how everything comes along, right? People fall in love with each other, people 
talk to each other. The lambs set up a grocery store in the front of the house and that draws the entire neighborhood there. The pickles and the lambs get together, they gamble, they, they cook, they enjoy life. And a lot, a lot, a lot of small events happen in this book. It's been described as a soap opera and it's quite like that. There's lots of little vignettes and moments which show us a little bit about each of these characters but they don't really add to any kind of overarching arc narrative and this book doesn't really have one. It doesn't have one big overarching arc. Instead it just has these characters who we get to know over the course of the novel. We see how they develop, we see how they see the world, we see how they, they each cope with the various tragedies that befall their family and we see how the forced cohabitation of Cloud Street enables them to connect and form relationships and express themselves to others. It's a very character-driven text and it's a very setting-driven text. And I think for those who quite like that feeling of just being somewhere and being with people, this book is quite successful. I just find it difficult because it's not a very elegant or beautiful book and it feels quite reluctant to go to that territory. Every now and then there's going to be a phrase that to me seems quite elegant or is moving towards something classically beautiful, whether it's a representation of a landscape or an emotional moment of character, and the prose itself seems to step back quite often. There is one moment quite early in the novel where Fish and Quick are on a boat sailing down the river in Perth, and they're trying to sail back home but they underestimate how far away it is, and so it's night time, they're just trying to make it through the water, and Fish notices that the stars in the sky are reflected exactly in the stars in the ocean, the black water beneath the ocean, the river, the black water underneath them. And it's just gorgeous and beautiful. And then there's a poop joke that happens immediately afterwards, right? And I just go, why would you put that there? Why would you take away the potential for beauty? Because these are teenage boys, right? And because this is a story that's largely about masculinity, I find that most of the characters that get the most detail and the most evolution are the men, especially when we connect their idea of masculinity with being the provider of the family, of being working or earning money or bringing in good fortune to their household. And so I think that reluctance to be beautiful holds the novel a bit back in my eyes. And the episodic structure, I didn't fully get into it because I don't know, I think, I don't know. Describing it now, 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 it sounds like something that I would enjoy, but I don't know why the experience of it just didn't quite get to me. There are also vague magic realist elements in there. I can't tell you why I think they're there. I actually, I just, I don't know. There's moments that make you go, that's a bit weird. And then, yeah, that's a bit weird. I just, there's a lot in there and it's messy. And I think maybe I wanted more of that structure. Maybe I wanted more individual stories to come out of it. Because the only other Tim Winton work I've read has been The Turning. And The Turning is short stories, and every short story is pointed. It's got something it's trying to observe. It also has nearly every single trope that happens in Cloud Street. It has missing fingers, it has uh, leaving and coming back, it has big houses, it has country boys and city boys, and uh, just lots of different ideas that reverberate in Cloud Street. And so I wasn't quite surprised by the novel as well because I feel like I've seen a lot of it before. So that's what I would say to justify my three out of five. Yeah, that's what I would give this novel. It's okay. Okay, book five of December is Blind Mist by Jose Saramago. This is a Portuguese writer who is writing about an, an unnamed city, but there are very small details that might suggest it is somewhere in Portugal. But it is not really a novel about Portugal. I'm just bending the rules a little bit to put this in my Globetrotter section. It is about a surprising and unprecedented epidemic of blindness that begins with this unassuming person waiting for the traffic lights to change, and that spreads to everybody they are in contact with. So they immediately go to the eye doctor to check what's, what's going on, right? Because all you can see is white. And the eye doctor very quickly goes blind as well, and so does everybody in that eye doctor's office. The government pounces on this and quarantines everyone who has gained this new white blindness into a abandoned mental facility, and because it's so contagious and because people are so afraid, these initial six characters are left to fend for themselves, but slowly but surely 
lots and lots of different people end up succumbing to this blindness and so society crumbles society falls apart and without the ability to see these characters completely lose their ability to engage with the world around them and they have to rely on each other especially the character of the doctor's wife who pretends to be blind so that she can go to the same facility as the doctor but she retains her sight and this becomes one of the most driving forces in the novel is that she ends up taking a caretaker role for everybody and she feels responsible for everybody because she can see and thus she becomes the person who relates the entire surroundings to everyone else but she's also got to keep this a secret because suddenly being the person who can see in a room full of blind people makes her very powerful and very valuable this is a bleak a bleak bleak book very bleak book because the speed at which society collapses due to the blindness is alarming just the the dark the just the depths of human depravity that people arrive at because of the lack of sight and because of the way that society restructures itself is just quite horrifying and the first half of the book is just that right it shows how quickly our routines and our behaviors and our trusts and all of the things that keep our society functional how how quickly all of those fall apart in the face of something like this blindness epidemic and so part one is just the book punching you it just feels like you're being punched over and over again it's just like constantly beating you down and shoving in your face just how bad humans can get and then book two is the aftermath of this now the society has crumbled now that the world is the way that it is or the city is the way that it is with everybody blind and everybody just trying to survive what hope can we find where can we find any semblance of humanity when humans have effectively reverted back to becoming animalistic beings only interested in food and satisfying their carnal pleasures and just trying to survive it's pretty harrowing it's not an easy read it will probably stay with me for a very long time all the way through reading this i was thinking to myself this would be a great Denis Villeneuve film, right? This would be a great film for one of those bleak-ass science fiction directors to just go to town on how bad the human race can get. And there is a movie of this, and I've noted that people don't tend to like the movie. Yeah, I think it's hard. It's quite hard because rendering the experience of the world around us without imagery, without sight, is super difficult. And I think the novel gives itself the contrivance of the doctor's wife who doesn't go blind, and that's really never explained. Uh, that becomes the ability of the author to still describe how things look, even when it doesn't make sense to, right? None of the other characters use sight. And it results in this really weird style of prose where, first of all, some things are just unseeable, some things just completely unknown, especially moments where they are set in dark areas where the doctor's wife also can't see. It's just a lot of mystery there. But also, the way the dialogue is rendered, they don't start a new line when there's a new speaker, which is like rule number one of grammar, right? So you suddenly get these massive walls of text chunk pages with paragraphs that go on forever. And the only way to know that it's a new character speaking, not even who's speaking, but just that it's a different person speaking, is that there's a capitalization and no end of a sentence for the previous sentence. So it very quickly becomes hard to figure out who's saying what. And although I've been told that this is the author's style, I think it works particularly well here because it mirrors that lack of knowledge and that confusion you get because of this sense that you've taken for granted and has now been taken from you. You don't get to know who's saying what. You don't get to know who this person is, right? You don't get to know anything about a person aside from the very bare details that the author gives you. These characters don't even get named, they are just their roles in the story. And it's a hard reading experience, it's a harrowing reading experience. I think that does say some really interesting things about what it means to be human. I would give it a 4 out of 5. I do have to note as well the rather unfortunate implications it gives about <laughs> real world blindness in that it's just that 
if the world was entirely blind, that society would crumble. And I don't believe that to be true because I know many blind people live perfectly fine lives. And the only character in this book who is blind prior to the events of the novel is not good. And I guess the point is that everyone is not good, but there is an uncomfortable implication that it is blindness itself which makes them not good, and that is, I, I guess it would be an incorrect reading, but it is a reading which is possible. And I think that does make the book just a little bit more uncomfortable in my eyes. Anyways, that's blindness. Very bleak. Don't read this if you want a good time. Alright, book six of December is going to be Patricia Highsmith's Talented Mr. Ripley. This is a crime novel that's set all around Europe. It has been described as psychological, but it's one of those old school crime novels, right? It's written in the 1950s, and it follows this protagonist named Tom Ripley, and he is a master manipulator, right? He is someone who is able to deceive others, plan three steps ahead, and try and get what he wants through manipulation rather than anything else. He engages in lots of soft crimes like uh, fraud or identity theft or something like that and we see how he works his way through his life how he gets by day by day and eventually how he commits much more heinous crimes and how he tries to get away from that so that's the main arc of this novel right is we follow this criminal and we think first of all what makes him tick and second of all how is he going to get away from the authorities having done what he has done we meet his character immediately and we see him interact with this wealthy family of the Greenleafs and the Greenleafs son is gallivanting around in Europe his name is Richard or Dickie and he's just trying to make it as a painter whereas the old aristocratic father is going this is a terrible life choice and so Mr. Ripley convinces himself convinces um, the Greenleaf father that they are best friends, and so Mr. Greenleaf sends Tom Ripley with money to Europe to try and convince Dickie Greenleaf to come back to America and follow in the family business. Then chaos ensues from there, right? Tom Ripley arrives in Europe and is very unable to convince Dickie to come back to America, but then chaos ensues. He starts committing a bunch of crimes, he starts tangling up this web of lies, and messing with the authorities in Italy and France and America and it's just this big quagmire of deception. I'm trying not to say very much because I don't want to spoil it but it is also... I had this thought where a lot of these high crime classics of the 1930s and 40s and 50s like The Big Sleep which I read earlier this year have not been that good. And I think part of it has to do with the moral sensibilities of the time. I think a book like this representing the protagonist as someone who commits crimes and tries to get, to get away with it and who is psychologically quite complex because this book really delves into what he's thinking as he does each of these things. It's probably something that was controversial and salacious in its own time. But reading it today, like going from blindness to this, right? Blindness is ridiculous in how gratuitous its representations of violence and sexual abuse and just horrifying acts that human beings can commit on other human beings. That's all in here in graphic detail. And The Talented Mr. Ripley, which I read, read immediately afterwards, is just tame by comparison. This book is just... it feels cozy even when it's not meant to because I feel like time and society and genre has moved on so much that there's not a lot I can extract from this. I think I would give this a 3 out of 5 because it does have some interesting character interactions and it did hook me along most of the way, but it doesn't maintain interest. And I think just so much time and culture has moved on between the 1950s to now today that the concerns of the characters don't really resonate. And even when the crime is murder, I'm just like, I'm not shocked, I'm not shook. Nothing surprises me. And maybe that's an ongoing problem with the crime genre, is that it needs to be fresh and reinventing and shocking. I can understand how this might be a very influential work, but 
did not enjoy it that much. Alright, last book for December is Burning Chrome by William Gibson. This is his collection of short stories that predated uh, Neuromancer. And this was a hallmark set of works in the cyberpunk subgenre of science fiction. It's all about hackers and augmentations and modifications of biology, about transhumanism, about brain uploading and dreams and the instrumentality of humanity. So we stop thinking about human beings as mortal figures who have two arms and two legs and live for a so so long amount of time. Instead, through the use of technology, we can change that. We can mix that up, right? We can make ourselves look different. We can alter our physical biology in whichever way we want. And so human beings take a much more different role in each of these stories, which explores the intersection of human limits with burgeoning technologies which were just arriving as the novel was being written in the 1980s. Things like computer networks, things like the internet, things like surgical and biological augmentations, all of these things come to a head in this book, which started a huge, huge movement, right? Cyberpunk today is such a well-known and distinctive genre, and here in this book we see the very roots, which is interesting because the first time I tried reading these stories, I DNF'd it, I didn't finish it because I just couldn't get into it. I didn't know what I was supposed to be seeing or feeling. I was getting a lot of scientific jargon thrown at me, but I didn't quite understand how it came together as an aesthetic whole. And having experienced more cyberpunk media in the meantime, mostly through video games, like having played Deus Ex and having played more indie titles like The Red Strings Club and Valhalla, things that revel in that cyberpunk aesthetic, I've come back to understand what this book's universe is like, right? What the cityscapes look like and feel like what the characters look like and feel like if they have certain augmentations. I think the things that are so difficult to imagine in these stories, in original, original incarnations, that has been made much more easy to imagine due to the ongoing popularity of cyberpunk as a genre. Whether it is the questioning of what it means to be human, or the more surface level aesthetics of something like Cyberpunk 2077, uh, just the neon and the surgical augmentations and the gratuitous violence, which is, this book has very much of as well. Gosh, it's such a violence book. Uh, we have lots of stories exploring our perceptions of reality, what it means to be a human being in this technologically enhanced environment, how do we know things are real, or how do we know other human beings are who they say they are or who we think they are, what kinds of factions arise when technology is so powerful that the world becomes shaped by information and the world becomes controlled by individuals who are better at manipulating these technological systems than others. Standard barriers of power and negotiation kind of fall away, and instead everyone is exploring this strange and uncharted territory. And these stories are quite hard to get into, I would say, unless you already are quite into the cyberpunk genre, which is ironic because this is the some of the first representations of cyberpunk. It predates Neuromancer, which is the probably one of the most well-known early works of cyberpunk, and it introduces some of the ideas that would later appear in Neuromancer, which I have not read. So I thought to myself, maybe the short stories would be a way in, and they were not. But I think at least it does equip me for getting into William Gibson's later work, which some of it is cyberpunk and some of it is not but a lot of it is very thoughtful and very questioning about our relationship with technology. This did make me think heaps, and I think there are ideas that get raised in some of these stories which will constantly be with me, so I have to give it a 4 out of 5, even if it was such a difficult experience. I don't know how well some of these stories stand alone, because the reading experience looking at character and plots and setting and development are not that good. Like, I can definitely name lots of sci-fi stories that have been much more engaging or entertaining, but these ones are very thoughtful, and if you are able to work through the distance and the challenge and just the sheer volume of science terminology you get just thrown at you without definition, then this might be quite an enjoyable read. So I would give this a 4 out of 5. 
And here we have this wheel again. I thought this worked quite well last month. I did get through Foucault's Pendulum and it was not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. It was quite readable and so I think I might spin it again. I've taken Foucault's Pendulum off and I've replaced it with two sets of books actually. I've replaced it with A Suitable Boy, which is one of the longest things I've ever seen. It's an enormous, enormous book. And also I've replaced it with the Kafka duology. So I want to read both The Trial and The Castle. And together, I think they're both quite lengthy and quite convoluted and confusing and difficult. I don't know what I'm going to get. Uh, again, I think that the difficulty level of these books vary greatly. And I'm not sure which ones are easier or harder, but it's nice than getting through these. So let's spin that wheel. Alright, and we're landing on... <laughs> okay. Okay, we get Gravity's Rainbow. Okay. Alright, so this is Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Finchon. I don't know if it was his first novel, actually. It might be. It's definitely known as one of his earlier ones, and it's huge. It's 760 pages. It was written in the 1960s, reacting against a lot of Cold War and post-World War II paranoia. It's about World War II, but in a very weird way, and it's difficult. It's known to be very difficult. It's quite infamously one of the most challenging novels in the English language. It was so divisive that in the year that they were going to... Well, the, e the year was eligible for the Nobel Prize, they decided not to give out a prize because half the panel loved this book and half this panel hated this book. And, well, let's see what the dealio is about. I know that the... Okay, so, as with the last one, there is a epigraph. It's by... Werner von Braun, I don't know who that is. Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. Every science has taught me, and continues to teach me, strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual existence after death. Grip. And very famously, that first line, a screaming comes across the sky. It has happened before, but there is nothing to compare to it now. Hmm. Huh. Well, I will see you guys at the end of January. Alright, and that's my books of December, which means that I have wrapped up a full year of reading around about seven books a month. And that has led to... what has it led to? What have I gained from doing this? That is going to be a video in the future. And so, I think what I'll end up doing is, in mid to late January or early February, maybe March if things don't go well, I'll have more recap videos of things I've read in 2022, what I've gained from the experience of reading all these different categories, how I would tier each of them, and there will be new categories for 2023. Things can be a bit more weird now, which is good. I feel like I have a much wider breadth of literature, whether it's the classics or the modern stuff or the international stuff. I can talk more at length about it, which means that when I read a new work, I can kind of situate it within a larger conversation rather than having to be confused and engage with it as if it's something brand new. So that has been fun, and thank you for joining me on this experience. I will see you guys next year, which is terrifyingly soon. Okay, goodbye! Or maybe actually I should say that maybe I'll see you guys this year, because knowing me, I will release this video in 2023. Wow, what am I doing?